I don't need any distraction. Good morning. Good to see everybody out on this beautiful Sunday morning. It being beautiful for you like hot, muggy, dusty weather. We've got about six, seven more days of this and then maybe it'll change. This morning I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13, 13 through 21 out of the New King James Version. Where's Barry? Before then, our usher, Brother Barry Cook, will pass up the center aisle. If you're visiting, we consider you our honored guest, and we'd like to have you back anytime you're in our area for any of our appointed services. This morning, Brother Andy Rutherford will have our song service, and Chris Hicks will offer our first prayer in this morning. Justin Malden will have our service. I believe Brother Anderson's in Trousdale County preaching. I think Justin said he was adding things to his sermon, and we all scolded him and told him to subtract a little, but he's still adding, I think. Again, it's good to see everybody this morning. Again, I'll be reading out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 21. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hopes fully upon the grace of that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in, your, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's works, Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold for your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And now we'll go to God in song. Our first song this morning we actually don't have a slide for, so I'll be archaic and ask you to grab your song books and turn to 823. 823. All the rest of the songs this morning will be on the PowerPoint. Number 730, 
7.30. After this song, Brother Chris Hicks will lead our opening prayer. <clears throat> Would you bow with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning for another day of life and for the opportunity that you've given us to come here and assemble and worship you. We pray, Father, in spirit and in truth. We pray, ask, Father, that you will bless each of us and uh, our congregation here. Help us to grow in, in not only number but in faith and in Christ's likeness. We pray your blessings on those that we know of who are sick, those that are afflicted and may have... Uh, be undergoing tests and procedures that will be mentioned later. We pray that you'll bless them, bless others maybe that uh, we don't know of and won't be mentioned specifically, but are, uh, are going through heartaches and struggles that we may not even be aware of. Father, we're thankful for this nation and the opportunity that we have and the freedom that we have to assemble in, in ways such as this. We pray that that will always be the case. We ask you to bless our nation, bless those who represent us, that they may do so in a worthy manner, that laws and decisions that are made will never bring reproach on your name, and that they will lead us closer to you rather than farther away. We pray your continued blessings upon this congregation, upon the elders who oversee us. We ask your blessings on Brother Anderson, Brother Malden, as they preach the word and work with our youth. We pray that you'll bless them with more years in thy service. We ask your continued blessings upon each of us. Forgive us when we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For anyone wishing to mark in your book, our invitation song this morning will be number 179. 179, following Brother Justin's lesson. <clears throat> and before the sermon, number 277. <clears throat> 277. I have heard.
Good morning and welcome to our services here in Carthage. We are delighted to see everyone out uh, this morning uh, choosing to come worship God and uh, God is pleased with that. We are delighted here uh, to have you with us this morning. As, as we begin, we're going to have some ushers who are going to come down the uh, center aisle. They're going to have uh, some information uh, about some announcements here at the congregation and also uh, contained within that are going to be some blank pages in the middle that you can take notes on. I'm going to have several uh, verses up here. Uh, there's going to be some things that won't be uh, included on the PowerPoint, so uh, you may want to be sure to jot those down if you want to go back in and reference those uh, or look at the things that we're going to be talking about this morning. As uh, was already mentioned earlier, uh, Brother Edward is away uh, starting another gospel meeting this morning that will uh, be going on this week and we'll mention uh, more about that a little bit later on. Uh, but this is the fifth Sunday, uh, which is a little uh, bit different. Uh, this is a time uh, that the, the elders have set aside uh, where our schedule uh, is a little bit different because it is the last Sunday. So Proceeding this service, we're going to have a Bible study, and we'd love for you to stay for that. And then after that, we're going to have a fellowship meal uh, where uh, there's always plenty of enjoyable food uh, that has been prepared, and we're thankful for those that have prepared that. And we would love for you to stay around for that and come enjoy that meal and fellowship with us. And then stick around for our afternoon service at 1230. Uh, again, because it is the fifth Sunday, the young men are going to be leading uh, in that service. Uh, they prepared for that service. Brother Matthew Jones will be bringing forth uh, the message at that time. He spoke a few weeks ago uh, for the summer series. Now he's speaking again for us uh, this morning. We appreciate uh, his desire and all of our uh, young men who are going to be serving and their desire to uh, grow as spiritual leaders and to mature. And, and we thank the elders for uh, giving them the opportunity to do that. It's always an encouragement uh, to see them uh, up here, and it's encouragement for them to be able to do it. So please stick around for that and be a part uh, of that service as well. As we get into this morning, one thing uh, that I have seen a lot of uh, lately, and I was, I, mean, I was trying to think of the best way to, to illustrate uh, uh, some of my thoughts this morning, but there is a trend uh, going on in our society today uh, and it, the name that has been given to it is, is cancel culture, uh, is what uh, you see today, this idea of cancel culture. And what that is, is when an individual uh, maybe achieves a goal or gets a position or, or does something, and it's usually in the public spotlight, uh, for whatever reason, people then have a tendency to try to dig into uh, this certain individual's background. And if they uncover anything that is potentially negative or derogatory, then they do everything they can to, to bring that to light and to put that out in public view and to use that to the detriment of whoever that individual is. And there's been uh, plenty of recent examples uh, of that. And uh, there are three recent examples uh, that stick out in my mind, and all three of them have to do with social media. Now, this is not a, a lesson about social media. Uh, where three, three different individuals uh, had done something and they got recognition or got a job or uh, one of those various things. And then as a result of that, people started going back and you know, researching these individuals. And in particular case, the, the three individuals that I have in mind, and I'm not going to mention them specifically, uh, things that were brought out were all things uh, that were said or done on social media when the three individuals were teenagers back in high school when we were teenagers. I don't know about you, but for me, I can safely say there's a lot of things that I did in my teenage years that I don't look back on fondly of, uh, that I wish that I hadn't done. Uh, but thankfully, that, that is in the past. But what is happening today are these things are getting brought out. Some things nine, ten years ago are getting brought out and getting brought forth. Even if the individuals are remorseful and regret what they've done, it's being used uh, against them. And so the idea and the thought process in my mind that I keep going back to is what has happened to the idea of forgiveness? You know, why are we not forgiving individuals uh, for the deeds that they have committed? And especially deeds that are years old, it's nothing that's ongoing, 
what, what is going on? And so this morning, as that has been on my mind and that, uh, uh, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot, I want us to talk about forgiving others. We're going to look at the Bible and we're going to look at biblically what does it mean uh, to forgive others. And I think now with our climate and with our culture, uh, it's a command that needs to be examined and a command that needs to be practiced. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, uh, it is read, or it reads there from Paul, says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Read, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. And in the verse that I've got highlighted up here, which we're going to uh, use here and then we're going to use at the end of the lesson, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive other trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is important when we're talking about God forgiving us, but when we're talking about forgiving others as well, because it is a threat to our salvation if we don't understand it and we don't practice it. It could jeopardize our place in eternity. Now, as we get in, we're going to look, we're going to define to make sure that we understand and we know uh, what forgiveness means and what God means when he tells us that we need to forgive others. So the first thing that I want to look at is uh, Jesus, because we got to understand that Jesus's message and the entire thing that he came to this earth for was forgiveness. That was his purpose on this earth, was to give us a means to have forgiveness of our transgressions and what we've done so that we could live with him eternally. He shed his blood for forgiveness. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, and this is in the midst of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. He says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. His blood was for the forgiveness of sins. And his message was also all about forgiveness. In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 47, it said, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of all nations beginning from Jerusalem. What was the message that was to go out? A message of repentance. For what? for forgiveness of sins. Now this is a, an idea that most of us know, but I want to continue to emphasize it. And then lastly, obedience to his message leads to forgiveness. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 says, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Jesus came for the sole purpose of reaching the lost, forgiving others, and that's the message that we are commanded to go out and to speak and to preach. And that is the message that out of love we are commanded to joyfully obey. So that we, no matter what our issues are, no matter what we've done, by coming to God in obedience, we will be forgiven of those things. Now this is in depth as I'm going to go on this part. and We're going to get into talking about what it means to forgive others. But we need to understand is the basis here, uh, and it's a point that I, I like to illustrate a lot, is God is asking us to do something that he himself is willing to do. He's not asking us to take part in something uh, that he himself is not going to do. And so I think we need to, to keep that in mind and, and remember that as we get into this lesson. So uh, forgiveness basics, defining forgiveness, um, and I went through probably 20, 30 definitions trying to figure out what would be the best way to, to state this. So the easiest thing that I could come up with is forgiveness is the release uh, of something. It could be a debt, it could be sin, guilt, etc. Okay, it could cover uh, a few different things. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12 
uh, as Jesus uh, here is speaking, uh, helps us illustrate the point a little bit when he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, when you have a debt, what does that mean? What does it mean when you have a debt? It means that you owe somebody something, right? Uh, it could be a monetary debt, uh, whatever it may be, but you owe somebody something. So in the financial world, when you think of forgiving somebody of their debt, if you forgave somebody of their debt, what would that mean? If you owe, uh, you have a loan against uh, your home or a vehicle or some piece of equipment, and they forgave you of that debt, what would that mean? It would mean you wouldn't owe it anymore, right? It wouldn't, you would not owe it. And in our minds and in my mind, you know, that's the easiest way to illustrate the forgiveness of a debt because it's something that we understand, we know, we can put a value on, uh, and it helps us understand it. But I want us to look at the parable of the unforgiving servant. So, servant. so if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 18 because we're going to read uh, this entire parable this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 18. And as we look at this uh, imagery and, and we look at this, uh, God is, is going to teach us uh, about what it means to forgive others of their debts. Um, so as we begin, it says, Then Peter came up to him. He said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven, or seventy times. Seven times. Depends on the translation there. There's a couple different ones. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw that he, what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place then his master summoned him and said to him you wicked servant i forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should you not have also had mercy on your fellow servant as i had mercy on you and in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart now here, as we think about this and we examine uh, uh, this parable, so the question is asked, how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody? How many times? Now again, some translations may say 70 times 7, some say uh, 77 times. Uh, it just depends. The point is not, Jesus was not putting a specific number on the amount of times that you were supposed to forgive somebody else. You didn't, you didn't have a a little checkbox, or you weren't able to tally it up and say, oh, well, this person has hit, hit 490 or 77 times, whatever it may be, that's it, I'm done, I don't have to worry about it anymore, they get no forgiveness from me. That's not the point that Jesus is trying to illustrate here. Jesus is trying to drive home the point uh, that you should forgive somebody whenever they come to you with a pendant at heart. You have to do it. If they truly come to you seeking forgiveness in the appropriate manner, you have to forgive them. And he goes on to illustrate it by using this parable. And to sum it up, there is an individual who owes 10,000 talents. Uh, now, in an effort to try to understand how much was 10,000 talents, uh, I came up with some various figures um, and this math is not going to be exact, but it's going to help illustrate the point. Uh, that many talents uh, would be equivalent to around $300 million. Okay, so let's just say it's $300 million. He comes forward and says, I need to be forgiven of this debt. It's a ton of money. That's the point. It's a lot, a lot, a lot of money that 
somebody is trying to be forgiven of. Um, and I can't even fathom uh, that, that amount of money, let alone owing that amount of money to somebody. And so he comes and he says, you know, I can't, I can't pay you. And he's going to get thrown in prison and he begs and the master forgives him. And the master says, I'm going to forgive you uh, of this large debt that you owe me. So that servant goes on his way and he forgives everybody else all the time, right? No, that's not what happens. You think he would learn from that, but that's not what he does. He then turns around and goes to somebody that owes him 100 denarii. And that is probably, if you assume, you know, X amount of dollars per day and that a denarii is a day's worth of work, you know, it could be 5000 to $8,000, okay, depending upon what you say an average day's work would have been there, wage would have been. But 5000 to $8,000 is what this servant owed him. He had just been forgiven of $300 million, and this individual owes him around five to 8000 So again, in relation, he's not, this servant doesn't owe him a ton. He owes him just a little bit compared to what he had just been forgiven. And what does he do about it? He says, no, nope, you got to pay me. I'm going to throw you in jail until you can pay the debt. Now, I don't know how he's supposed to earn money to pay the debt while he's in jail, so you think about that aspect of the story as well. Is he ever going to get paid back? Does he want to be paid back? Other servants see it, and they go to the master, who then rebukes him and says, Do you not understand? You know, I forgave you of this, and you did not forgive and have mercy on your fellow servant like I did to you. The burden that I relieved you of, the debt that I relieved you of, was huge and it was great. And you couldn't have enough mercy to forgive a tiny fraction of what I had forgiven you. God has absolutely forgiven us of numerous debts that we've incurred. And when you think about the things that God has forgiven us of, if we individually examine our lives and we think, what has God forgiven me of? What have I done in my life? What transgressions have I done in my life? And we think of ultimately as a result of the sin that we commit, the destiny that we truly deserve by our rebellion against God, what we deserve and then what He's forgiven us of in the place that He's going to allow us to go because of His mercy and His forgiveness we're going to be able to enjoy heaven versus eternal damnation in hell because of God's love for us, because of what God has done, because God is choosing to forgive us. How can we then turn around to anyone and say, I can't forgive you for anything? When I was in the second grade, uh, there was an individual... Uh, it was a very prominent story, and most of you, if I, if I mention the name, would know this. There was an individual who was, who was basically assassinated uh, in Putnam County. Uh, he, uh, an individual came to his farm and, and, and shot him and fled. Uh, but he chose to, uh, to willingly carry out uh, a murder. And this individual and his family were members of the church. And during the man's trial... the family requested that the death penalty be taken off the table. That was their decision to do that, but they wanted to, to do it to give the individual the opportunity um, you know, to over, overcome the, the sin in his life. But they told him, in, yeah, they looked at him and told him the family did, that they forgave him for what he had done to his family. It wasn't an ac accidental killing, it wasn't a killing out of negligence. It was a planned murder. It was something that had evil intent and the individual did it. But that family, despite all that, was willing to forgive the individual. And they not only wanted to forgive the individual, wanted to do it because they wanted that man to have the opportunity to see his misdeeds and to understand the love of Jesus. And I think about that story and I think about the things and the wrongs that have been done to me 
which do not compare to the wrong that was done to this individual. And I question myself when I try to hold grudges or try to, try to hold anger to the level of what am I doing? Does it make any sense for me to hold grudges against others? And then we have to ask ourselves, does it make sense for us to expect the forgiveness of God? Because I know I pray often for God to forgive me. And I know that He's going to forgive me and I expect Him to forgive me because He's told me He's going to do so. But does it make sense to expect that out of God? But then I don't hold myself to that expectation when others mess up and when others do wrong. We have to not only be willing, but we have to desire to forgive others. Just like Jesus and God desire to forgive us. The effect of forgiveness, though, and the thing that we have to remember is reconciliation. Reconciliation, the repair of a relationship, is the ultimate goal. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I'm going to cut, hit on it here a, a little bit uh, on the next point, but the, the point of forgiveness is to come back together. It's not to hold something against someone. It's not to bring it up later on in life and, hey, you remembered what you did to me. I said I forgave you, but I'm going to bring it up and hold it against you now. That's not the point of forgiveness. The point of forgiveness is to repair the hurtful feelings and the damage and what separates us from one another. Just as sin separates us from God and is a barrier to our relationship with God, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us and forgives us of that sin so that we can be closer to God and we can be reconciled with God, forgiveness of one another should bring us closer to each other, to bring us back into a proper relationship that we should have with one another. So when you think about forgiveness, understand it's not just saying, hey, sorry, and it's not just carrying out that word that says, oh, you're forgiven. What does your heart say? So we look at that. Let's think about, is forgiveness conditional or is it unconditional? Uh, are there anything, is there anything to forgiveness? Is there anything that has to happen for forgiveness to occur? The first question I, I would ask and and is, does God forgive us conditionally or unconditionally? 1 John chapter 1 and verse 19 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in order to be forgiven of sins from God, what do we have to do? We have to confess those sins, right? We know that when we look in Scripture that repentance is required. When we look at the plan of salvation, repentance is required before we obey the gospel, and repentance is required afterwards when we come forth to God. Let's look at Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. It says, And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should because of one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive. So there we are told in order for forgiveness to occur that the individual must have a penitent heart. They must 
be willing to correct whatever the issue may have been. Just as God expects us to forgive others, whenever we go or whenever somebody seeks forgiveness from us, they need to correct you know, whatever may have been done. And there may not be anything that can be done or a correction that can be done. And they may come to you with the, the proper mindset and the proper heart uh, and make sure that the issue was fixed going forward. But Jesus says, if that occurs, you've got to forgive them. If they come to you seven times, you've got to forgive them seven times in a day. There's no limit to the forgiveness that has to occur. Now, there is a responsibility on both parties to do what is necessary for forgiveness to occur. When you think about forgiveness, and if I want to forgive somebody for something that they have done, what do I have to do? Well, I have to let them know, but then not only that, they have to be willing to accept the forgiveness. In or God is willing to forgive us of everything, but it requires us to obey the gospel. It requires us to love Him. It requires us to live faithfully and to come to God in order to obtain that forgiveness of sin and to obtain salvation. In order to be forgiven of others, and there may be some things that others don't know, we have to be willing uh, to go forth uh, to them. One thing, and this is what I added that is not up here if you want to mark it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, if you want to jot that down. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And this is Jesus speaking, and he's specifically speaking about anger uh, at, at this point uh, uh, in his sermon. But he says, So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. There Jesus is saying we have to take action. If there's something amiss between, between us and someone else, and we know about it, and we know it's amiss, what are we supposed to do? Take action. And not only take action, he's saying there specifically, if you were at the altar, you're about to perform an act of worship. That's going to be between you and God. That, may be, that is affecting that relationship. You have to go fix this relationship. You have to fix what is standing between you and this other individual? The heart of forgiveness is the desire to restore that broken relationship. That's what God desires of us, is the restoration of broken relationships. When something is going on, when something has happened, when there's a rift, whatever it may be, it's not just to say, hey, I forgive you and hold a grudge. It's to forgive one another and to get back in the proper relationship and working hand in hand together as Christians. How do I know if I am where I need to be regarding forgiveness? How, how do I know that? Well, it's a hard issue. It is a hard issue. God's done everything to allow us to be reconciled with Him, and we must be the kind of forgiving people that God has called us to be. As you examine yourself and you examine where you are in your life right now, and you examine your relationships, and that's why I say it's a hard issue, because you are the one that has to know. You are the one uh, that knows if there is something amiss between you and, and someone else, between a brother and sister in Christ, or even with your relationship with God. Jesus was all about forgiveness. God and Jesus are today all about forgiveness. Are we about forgiveness 
That's a hard concept. That's, that's difficult at times for us as Christians. When somebody messes up and when somebody does wrong to us, to be able to say, it's okay, I forgive you, I'm not going to hold it against you, I'm going to move on, and we're going to continue to, to have a, a positive relationship. So we go back and we look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. It says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This morning I want to ask you, do you have any trespasses in your life? Is there anything going on in your life that is amiss between you and someone else or between you and God? God's going to forgive us if we live faithful to Him. Part of living faithful to Him is forgiving others when they mess up, when they do us wrong. And in order to obtain that forgiveness from God, we have to be willing to forgive others any time that they mess up as well. Do you need forgiveness? The answer to that is we all do. But right now in your state, as you examine yourself, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you come into contact with the redeeming, forgiving blood of Jesus through baptism? Maybe you have, and maybe now in your walk as a Christian, You've allowed things to come between you and God. You've allowed things to come between you and your relationship with others. Well, the beauty is that God is always there with open arms. And no matter what it is that we have done, through repentance, God is willing to forgive us. This morning you have the opportunity, as the invitation is being offered, if you need prayers uh, on behalf of anything, you need prayers for forgiveness, uh, come forward now as we stand and as we sing. God is calling the prodigal, come with